record to the cloud. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our latest installment of the Pacific Northwest Clean Water Association Continuing Education Series. It's one o'clock. I think we'll hang tight for a minute or so while people trickle in um, and then we'll get started here shortly. All right, it is 101, so I think we'll get started with a couple housekeeping items. Again, thank you for being here today for the Pacific Northwest Clean Water Association Continuing Education Series. Uh, today we have an exciting presentation uh, with Aqua Aerobic Systems. Uh, but before we start that, uh, I'll remind everybody that you must attend for the full hour in order to receive uh, the continuing education credit. Uh, we have folks monitoring the attendance at the beginning and the end of the session, so um, you must stay online for the full hour in order to receive the credit. PNCWA will follow up with CEU information in the next day or so. So if you don't hear from us right away for that, uh, just hang tight. We do have the documentation we will send out. Uh, as the presentation, as we're going through the presentation for the next hour, please use the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the screen if you have questions you'd like to pose to the speaker. Um, alternatively, we'll have some time at the end of the discussion for questions so you can save them for then, um, excuse me, save them for then and post in the chat box at that time. Okay, so um, our present presenter today is John Dyson. John is the product manager for Aqua Aerobic Systems and holds a BS degree in chemistry from Longwood College. He has experience working with many treatment technologies, including clarifiers, filters, headworks equipment, disinfection processes, biological processes, and membrane processes in both water and wastewater segments of the industry. Over his 25 plus years in the industry, John has worked on many projects varying from size from 0.1 MGD to 600 plus MGD with multiple technolo technologies. John's breadth of experience gives him a unique ability to evaluate and determine the best solutions for his clients. In addition, he has been involved in the introduction of several new technologies throughout his career. So with that, I'll hand the floor over to John and thank you for joining us today. Okay, um, thanks very much, uh, Casey, uh, for that introduction. And I'm gonna start sharing here. Is, that, is everything displaying good? Okay, all right. You'll, Again, you'll everyone, good. all right. Thank you for your time today and uh, look forward to your questions at the end. So we're going to talk about uh, pile cloth media filtration and how it can be used to handle the peak flows, mitigate those, and help utilities meet monthly permit limits and regulatory requirements in these conditions. So I like to kind of start off uh, presentations with hopefully what you will get out of this uh, presentation, um, maybe develop an understanding of what uh, problems are created with peak wet weather flow events. 
uh, understanding how peak wet weather flow management works uh, in a facility, understand the options available to handle this. And we're gonna talk about one of the technologies, but I will talk about some other technologies. So there, there is uh, several technologies that can be utilized here. And these are really classified as enhanced high rate treatment technologies. Uh, develop an understanding how this allows you to meet your permit and regulatory requirements. And of course, uh, with our technology, we have some unique benefits with the dual treatment options and uh, those benefits associated with that. So during the presentation, we're gonna cover, you know, what the issues are with peak wet weather flows, uh, the options available uh, that we typically think about, define what peak wet weather flow management and mitigation is, uh, what are enhanced high rate treatment technologies? There are many different types uh, there. Talk specifically about the Aquarobics Aquastorm enhanced high rate treatment technology, the pile clock media. Go through some short case studies, talk and give some good examples. Then talk about permitting and regulatory briefly, some of the questions that typically come up and then answer your questions at the end. So uh, as we move forward into this presentation, you know, what are peak wet weather flows? You know, where do they occur? What are those type of things? So, I mean, they really can occur for any size installation or town, city. They can be very small plants to very large plants. So I'm sure we're, you know, everyone has a different size facility. It can be for CSO, combined sewer uh, system communities, or only sanitary only type systems. So this problem is not unique to just one type of uh, collection system. Uh, that problem can be at the treatment plant, you know, which I think is what we all think about all, mostly, but it also can be at remote sites where, you know, you can't get all the flow to the treatment plant. Uh, so there's wide range of places where these problems can occur specifically. Uh, that can result in, you know, overflows in the network, out of manholes, or at uh, individual sites that are actually designed to relieve the uh, uh, collection network. Um, this is an extreme case, but this plant, when it's going through a major storm, it's actually overflowing out of its treatment basin. So I'm sure they're having a major upset conditions. You know, what other problems do, does it cause? You know, one of the things I think when we deal with these peak flows, once they reach, reach the treatment plant is we can stress our, our existing treatment systems to the point that are upset. And now you're not meeting permit limits. So ultimately, what are we trying to avoid even uh, and ultimately is permit violations um, that, that are here. And there are ways to do that and handle these peak flows that we're talking about. So what are the options to utilities? Um, and when you break it down, we've generally taken it in, in very simple fashions in terms of the options that are available to handle these peak flows that treatment plants can experience. You know, one of the main ways that we are trying to resolve this problem is to reduce the I and I work. Uh, and that means constantly we're repairing our networks, putting in new lines, uh, but constant work in this area to reduce the influence of these wet weather conditions, whether it's a combined sewer system or if it's a sanitary system only. Uh, one of the typical way people think about dealing with it, well, we'll just collect it in tunnels or storage tanks, uh, use our network to store it. Uh, those are generally how we think about uh, handling these wet weather flows. But uh, in many cases, uh, I think people find that, can you build enough uh, storage uh, to contain these wet weather events? And with the climate change, I think we're all seeing more intense storms, which means it becomes even more difficult to collect and store the volumes that are there. An option that has been utilized throughout the country um, is to actually use uh, some of the newer enhanced high rate treatment technologies. They generally are, are gonna provide very compact footprints and be able to provide this auxiliary type treatment process to your existing main treatment train. By adding this enhanced high rate treatment, you're able to add more treatment capacity, but not necessarily the footprint uh, in, in achieving that capacity of treatment. 
So, you know, what is wet weather treatment? And when we think about uh, peak flow treatment, handling those peak flows. And so I'm going to go into and break it down and go through a description of it and, and what we typically deal with. Uh, but generally, on any average day flow, uh, dry weather conditions, we have an average flow. And just as a talking example here, I'm going to say that average day flow condition is about 1 million gallons. We design our treatment plants generally, depending on the size of the facility, from about 1.5 to 4Q of that average day. We're able to design generally our biological treatment systems in that type of range effectively. At that point where we start getting over 4Q, now we're, we're starting to worry about an F to M ratio in our biological system and other issues that associated with it. And then generally we'll finish with either a tertiary treatment stage or di just disinfection to our receiving stream. And this is just a simple flow, flow diagram. When we deal with peak wet weather flow conditions, what we're really talking about is when we exceed that uh, capacity of the biological treatment chain. In this case, an example would be 4Q. Once we start seeing those flows, how do we handle the, those conditions? And people do many things. They try to push it through the plant, but could have upset conditions, those type of things. Another way to do that is to utilize these enhanced high rate treatment technologies I'm gonna talk further about and the AquaStorm technology. It could be either a clarification system or a filtration system, which we're gonna talk about here. And here we're taking that flow, we design these systems capable of starting up really quickly, handling those flows over 4Q. And depending on your collection systems, uh, whether it's a CSO or sanitary system, some of these systems can see from average day flow, you know, anywhere from six to 10. Um, some facilities have seen as high, that I've seen and worked with have had as high as 14 Q. Uh, Q, the average day flow condition. So um, this is a way to handle those flows without overstressing the biological train, allowing it to work continuously. What do these technologies bring, these enhanced auxiliary uh, treatment technologies? They bring an extremely high removal efficiency of the solids. And why is this important? Well, in wet weather, we get a dilutioning uh, which means our soluble BOD levels, our BOD levels are generally uh, decreasing, but we still have a large amount of solids. In the process, and, and remembering here is we want to disinfect this water too, is by taking those solids out, we can effectively disinfect uh, the uh, flow. So when you combine the two flows back together for disinfection, you can do effective disinfection to the uh, water. So a lot of people may talk about this and I'll go into a little as a diversion or a bypass. Not really, what you're really doing because you're controlling when this occurs, you maximize the flow through your biological train. You're really splitting and intercepting a portion of the flow and running it through a treatment process. And that's an important thing to remember. So what are some of the benefits or why would you consider doing peak wet weather flow management? And um, I got this information from the WEF guide on municipal wet weather strategies. And it was outlined as a decision-making criteria if you would head into this direction to deal with wet weather. But in many ways, it's the, also the benefits of doing this. Well, what is it from to the environment? Well, of course, you're going to provide an improved water quality. If you can't handle those wet weather flows effectively. You may have upset conditions or you're, you're uh, by actually bypassing untreated wastewater. What does that do? It improves uh, the water quality to sensitive areas. I live in Richmond, Virginia, so on the East Coast, we have the Chesapeake Bay. Well, it pr helps protect when you do this type of thing, you know, your uh, beaches, uh, shellfish, it, harvesting areas, those type of things. So we're really impacting the environment by doing treatment, providing a high quality effluent. And when you do this type of thing, you're generally able to, or all the time, able to meet your, your permit conditions. You design these systems to achieve that. Technically, now we are actually improving our uh, uh, 
quantity of flow that we can actually manage. Uh, we maximize our conveyance system. And importantly, we, we remove pathogens with the physical separation. Uh, oysters, clams, these type of things uh, in our wastewater, they filter out this. They actually end up in the food chain uh, if we, we're not doing this type of thing. Uh, we maximize our existing infrastructure so we utilize our treatment plants to their fullest capacity. Uh, and of course, most importantly, is we're eliminating these uh, untreated discharges that are there. And generally, what you're going to find because of the operational flexibility with these enhanced technologies, they're simpler uh, to operate, much lower operating costs associated with it. But ultimately, our, our rate payers, uh, the citizens, what do they want? They want to to have uh, less overflows occurring. This allows us to achieve that. Uh, technologies utilizing minimal land, but most importantly, in much more affordable rates because these projects are, are gonna be much more cost effective. So there's many benefits for a lot of different folks. Other questions that I think are critical when you start thinking about peak wet weather flow management is, you know, uh, everyone has a network rehabilitation program. Are you seeing the decreases in I and I? If not, you know, this is when you think about doing this at a treatment plant. Uh, well, you know, what's the time frame for the I and I work? You could be making progress, but it's generally a very long time frame to achieve this work that's there. So maybe you can make more of a water quality impact now by applying treatment. Uh, you know, will you still have overflows even if you finish all of the, your major plans for your I and I work? Uh, can you build storage? If your storage is the direction you think about, can you build enough and prevent having overflows with these changing storms and the intensity that we see due to climate change? Is storage cost effective uh, and is it possible? Sometimes you don't have the land area to actually put in enough storage. You, even if you feel like it was cost effective. Um, and then ultimately, when you evaluate any use of different technologies or different solutions, does it meet your needs? Does it allow you to provide those benefits to the rate payers, to the utility, uh, to all parties associated in their industry that are there? So these are some questions I think that are, that are critical. So I'm gonna next go into briefly hit on, you know, the wide range of technologies that we've used, but then more focused on, of course, the aqua aerobics, aqua storm technology. Uh, over the years, we've done a lot of different things from different types of just media filters to just removing floatables with our wet weather. Doesn't give us a whole lot of mo uh, uh, removal generally in, with these technologies. More commonly, uh, initially, we used to do, you just use settling basins to handle uh, our wet weather flows. Uh, but as rates go up and settling basins performance go down, and there's several different technologies here that, that do provide removal, but generally these technologies are only going to give you about 40 to 50 percent TSS removal. When we move into what we would consider enhanced removal technologies, that's when we take primary basins and we start adding chemicals to them uh, as just one example. Um, over time, there's been other technologies developed that are there, including clarifiers and filtration type technologies over the years. The market generally, when you start to think about wet weather treatment and enhanced high rate treatment, um, it's going to really focus really primarily now into two different areas, your high rate clarifier process or your ballasted type process that are highlighted in red here. And then also your high rate filter technologies, which we're going to talk more about the AquaStorm technology here today. So there's been a lot of things used over the years, but most importantly, I really think where, where the market is headed when you think about peak wet weather flow uh, management is these high rate clarifiers and high rate filters are usually the technologies of choice. So I'm gonna move in and really talk about our AquaStorm technology and, and the basic operations. And this technology has actually been around for 30 years. Uh, we've utilized the cloth media, pile cloth media filtration uh, for tertiary applications for, for 30 years now. 
And we, one of the things we've always known, it was able to handle a high rate uh, amount of solids being applied to the technology that it could easily handle the upset conditions. But when we looked to expand the application into the wet weather side, we knew we were dealing with a different type of influence. And one of the key things that we had to recognize is now we have floatable materials coming into the system. So we designed the system to have floatable removal. The core of the technology is still air filtration that we do through our pile cloth media here and depicted by here. So most of the work is being done here, but because we're dealing with na primary nature solids, uh, these solids, uh, some of them do settle. So we uh, arranged our system to allow the solids to do settle, to concentrate, to settle, and periodically remove those off. So we actually are using three mechanisms of solids removal, uh, really different than any tech other technology out there because we are able to combine principles of settling within the system along with filtration and float removal. So we're kind of unique in that aspect. So how does the system work? And I'm gonna go through this in uh, animation here. So influent flow comes in, this is a package unit over an influent weir here. Solids that are heavy, that wanna settle, we allow it to settle. We filter outside in through our cloth media down the effluents collected in the center tube and out over an effluent weir. Effluent weir keeps the disc submerged. As solids are gonna build up on the cloth, uh, like you would anytime you're collecting material, that causes the water level in the tank to rise. Uh, we work on a one foot differential. At that point, we now start to rotate the center tube and discs. And we're actually now, just like my last name, Dyson, we're literally pulling the solids off like a vacuum cleaner, but our median here is the water. So the water that's being filtered uh, above and below the backwash shoe area is actually just being pulled back through at a super high rate. So the filter is never offline because we're only backwashing a portion of the disc at any given time. This depicts that we can wash uh, two discs at a time. We have four of them in this eight disc set. We can put as many as 24 discs on the system and wash eight discs at one time. Uh, the hoppers that I mentioned earlier, we added these to the system and every about eight to 10 backwashes we pump off solids. We found that this manages that we don't build up a sludge blanket in the system and that would come in contact with the cloth uh, during its normal operations. Uh, and then of every eight to 12 hours, floatable material that builds up on the surface that's flowing from the influent end, which would be on the right-hand side to the effluent end, we have a submerged trough. We just open a valve and do a hydraulic decanning to remove those floatable materials off. So it's a very automated system. Uh, it's very simple. And what you're really utilizing here is the physical separation capabilities along with settling here to, to get your removal of solids. Because we're talking about wet weather applications, uh, these units can be set, set dry. Uh, and when they're dry like this, um, you, then you'd have to say, what do you need to do to start them up? Um, with the unit sitting dry, basically to start up a unit, you open the inflowing gate or valve, depending on the unit uh, there, and the unit will start to fill up. Uh, we allow the tank to fill. Once that water levels to the effluent weir, technically you're in an operation and actually filtering. So you're in that filtration mode. And based on the uh, level probes that we have or level transmitters that we're utilizing, uh, it'll start to backwash and waste automatically. So it's a very simple operation to start it up. There's no you know, pre-startup, it's literally just open it up, the tank fills and you start to, to, to perform. To shut a unit down, it's almost as simple. Uh, we just close the influent gate at the end of a, an event and the unit is offline. Of course, we're gonna to wanna to, uh, drain in, uh, the unit to take it off to store it between events. Uh, we have an automated initiated procedure that an operator can hit. And basically what it'll do is open the scum valve first, remove that water that's uh, remaining in that trough. Then it'll go into a continuous backwash. Because we are utilizing the water in the tank, 
uh, when we're backwashing even normal operation. Uh, we're, we use that to pull the water level down. It cleans the cloth off to get prepare it for the next event to occur. Uh, once it reaches about uh, water level just above the backwash here, we transition to solids waste. So now we're pulling any solids that remain in the tank in the bottom of the system off and to be removed out. And then I'll leave about a foot there just because of pump protection uh, level that will have to be removed via the, the drain on the systems. And I generally recommend because it's always good for any piece of equipment to do uh, good maintenance is after an event, it doesn't have to be done immediately, but whenever it has time, just spray off the, the system with a garden hose, just to anything that's stuck on a wall or those type of things can be uh, flushed down the drain. So you don't get any odors or smells that are there. We, I showed you a package unit. This is just giving a view of what a concrete unit would look like. You'd have an influent trough or influent channel that's there. We have influent weirs. You have your center tube uh, and uh, discs that are there, the scum trough, the effluent weirs, a gallery area for the pumps and the backwash pumps along with a common effluent channel. And depending on the number of units, you just continue to mirror these out that are there. To give a little better view through a section view, you can see a lot of the same components uh, listed out. But just to give you an example, the hoppers here on this largest unit, this is the largest unit, it has a hydraulic capacity of 20 to 24 MGD, depending on solids loadings uh, coming into the system. But that hopper is approximately four feet deep uh, that you see there. And that allows the sludge that does settle to concentrate and be removed out periodically. There. So I'm gonna next move into the actual, how can the technology be put within the treatment plant? Um, we're utilizing this not only for wet weather, but we're also utilizing the technology now as a replacement to primary clarifiers uh, because it provides a high removal efficiency when you reduce your loads to your biological system. So you could apply it up front in your treatment plant, but because you're providing an excellent water quality, when you have these peak wet weather flows, you could uh, uh, split a portion of the flow around the biological system, say that flow over the four here, recombine it to allow you to handle that uh, peak flow conditions that you have for short durations that are there. So this is one application that you could utilize here. So here it's being used as a dual use for advanced primary treatment and wet weather. More classically, when, when people think about wet weather treatment, they really think about, they've got this treatment train off to the side that's not used very often. So that would be more like this configuration that when wet weather occurs and the unit is sitting off to the side, you take the flow over the 4Q as an example here, you filter it, recombine it after your secondary clarification followed by disinfection. When we're arranged in this type of uh, situation, generally the backwash waste on all the waste from the system is just sent to the primary clarification uh, and, and removed through the primary clarification and biological train. And remembering generally we're dealing with dilute conditions during this time frame, So that means basically we're providing food to the biological system and that's there. But because the technology was based off of our tertiary uh, technology originally, uh, we had the capabilities to use it in another dual application. In this case, uh, in dry weather conditions, we could just have secondary effluent that, that is going through, say, one of the two units that are depicted here. When wet weather occurs, the flow would uh, flow over the 4Q. That portion would be redirected uh, and split and brought in front of the filter. So now we're filtering both uh, secondary effluent and uh, wet weather flow. We filter both, follow it by disinfection. So you're getting here beneficial use of the technology uh, versus the side stream treatment where it's sitting and is only being used, you know, maybe 30 days a year for only even, you know, small portions of time, even in those days that are there. This actually gives you use of the technology even during those dry weather conditions. Uh, because the technology is very versatile and you'll say this looks very similar to what you were just showing. You're showing it 
in the tertiary mode, taking secondary F1. I call this kind of try treatment because, um, you know, there are many different ways to look at it. So we can actually do the dry weather tertiary treatment as depicted here, ways to go back to the front plant of the plant. And we go into the dual operation here. And what you have here is it's doing the dual filtration like I depicted in the last application. Um, but we actually have plants under construction that actually have a kind of third mode where it actually has the capabilities to redirect the secondary affluent around the filters uh, in that case and only do basically the side stream treatment. And the reason for this is some of the facilities get pretty big and they like the idea of the dual treatment, but they don't wanna build that additional capacity there knowing what their peak wet weather condition is. So this allows them to operate in three different modes of operation, depending on how big the rainfall events are and the conditions that may be experienced. So very versatile from how you can apply the technology. Last I'm gonna talk about in, in is, it can be used for remote sites. So when you can't get the flow to the treatment plants, very much like side stream treatment, you screen it, you go through the treatment, uh, the AquaStorm technology followed by disinfection. And in this case, you wanna take out enough out of your uh, 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 line going to the plant or your truck line going to the treatment plant so you can put the backwash waste and settled waste in there and send it to the treatment plant. But this is in the cases where you have these overflow points out in the network. This is more common with CSO type systems. So next I'm gonna go into some case studies and, and talk about some, some of the projects that we've worked on and some of the, 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 these type of things. Um, just to give you an idea of with the AquaStorm technology right now, uh, these are the states where we have uh, units that are either in operation or under construction. Uh, this year, uh, we'll have a few more that we're adding uh, before the end of the year contracts and, and so on. So it's a growing in technology. We just started uh, introducing this to the market a little about four years ago. So it's relatively new, but um, uh, very much uh, progress and acceptance quickly. So I'm gonna talk about Elkhart, Indiana and, uh, to give some examples. And this is gonna be a side stream treatment application. Uh, it's an existing wastewater plant you see here. This plant's actually divided by a major road. On the left-hand side is the biosolids side. And of course you got the wet side on the right-hand side. Um, this plant is a CSO facility, uh, has an average day flow of about 14 million gallons they can get. Uh, consistently good effluent out up to about 30 MGD. And one of the problems here at this uh, actual location is uh, their real limitation is their secondary clarifiers. Existing ones are very shallow and they really don't have any land, uh, buildable land area to actually add more secondary clarifiers uh, at this facility. So they had to look to an alternative and the AquaStorm technology has been selected for this project. Ultimately, because of this descent decree, the increased capacity that they need to achieve is 60 million gallons. So uh, as part of this, we had to pilot test uh, at the facility. And so uh, we tested here, and this is the TSS removal uh, during the wet weather events. So we had pretty wide range of influent TSS conditions from a little over 150 to up over 300 for the average for the events. And you can see we got excellent effluent out. And for the study, we averaged uh, about 23 milligrams per liter. The highest I think was about uh, 32 milligrams. But you can see excellent removal, over 80% removal, some cases near 90% uh, removal here of the solids. On the BOD, of course, um, we're looking at here, uh, again, high removal percentages of the BOD uh, based on the influent conditions. So with these levels of removal, when you combine that with the actual treatment plant's performance out of this uh, treatment plant, you're easily able to meet permit limits. So as part of the process, the engineer on this uh, project put together a model to to kind of show everyone how this was going to work 
at the facility. So knowing the conditions, the plant has excellent data. They took the information from the events from 2016 here, and we combined them with their 2018 pilot results. And knowing the volumes that the plant was treating, okay, and the volumes that would be required to be treated by, by the auxiliary treatment train, the side stream treatment, combine the, the pilot results with why you have a band here uh, with the effluent results of the plant, combine those two flows together. And as you can see, for the individual events, we far, we're far below the levels that were required for the monthly permits limits of 25 and 30 milligrams per liter respectively. So this is just an example how when you combine the two flows uh, with, with the conditions coming in, maintain the plant at peak operating conditions so they're maintaining an excellent effluent out of the system, you can easily meet the permit limits. So that's BOD and TSS. Some of the other parameters in Indiana, they specifically uh, want to look at phosphorus. Orange is the phosphorus, as you can see. We, we, in this case, we had alum uh, in the application. So the combined effluent allows us to easily meet the one per minute of out. Now you'll see ammonia. We don't actually remove ammonia. Ammonia is soluble. But what's important to understand and, and how this is uh, done is when you look at the actual events, uh, et cetera, that you can see here in the bands that we're able to meet the monthly permit limits uh, also here for ammonia uh, based on the influent conditions that are there even for the individual events days. So this is just how the, the concept of peak wet weather flow management will let you meet your permit requirements. So next I'm gonna talk about another study and project in Rushville, Indiana. Um, this project uh, has been operating for many years. This is a dual treatment application um, that we went through. So this project originally was gonna be a, a 1 million gallon storage tank. Uh, we introduced the technology, worked with the, the utility and the engineer uh, with regulatory piloting that would be required, uh, developed the whole project and it's been, been, op been operating for many years now. Uh, just, just a quick view in the pilot testing event. The first two events we added alum because they were interested in phosphorus removal. And as you can see here, excellent removal of TSS, BOD, phosphorus when we added the alum. As you can also see for the, the, the other three events, we had good removal of TSS, BOD. Of course, we didn't get the phosphorus removal because we weren't adding the alum that was there. A slight difference in BOD removal. So in this study, it was determined that there was a secondary benefit for adding the uh, uh, alum there to also enhance the BOD removal at this facility. Uh, so ultimately, when we went to the regulators for approval, uh, the engineer presented uh, a few uh, data points to them to explain why this dual treatment would be advantageous. Well, the plant as it existed, okay, being their typical TSS discharge out of the facility is the column on the left. And then when you combine the TSS discharge uh, for, for the CSO flows that they had here, they were discharging over 50,000 pounds a year. If they put the CSO basin in, okay, they would reduce the wet weather flow conditions that they, they've seen there, but they're not doing any further removal of solids due to the ability of adding tertiary filtration. Uh, the Aquaprom, Aquastorm technology here, when you combine that, dramatically reduce the overall discharges to the river from on a yearly basis. And basically that was a 42% to 72% removal. Uh, very similarly for the BOD, uh, similar in type of numbers, uh, similar impacts ultimately to, to the discharge out of the treatment plant. So 51 and 68 were the estimated numbers. So the state actually did come back, say that's what we like, um, and we would like you to do the dual application for this specific facility. The Rushville installation has an average day flow of 1 million gallons uh, with a biological capacity of about four to four and a half MGD. 
Uh, but they can see peak flows as high as 14 million gallons instantaneously. Uh, I'm going to actually show one of the events uh, not too long, about six months after the facility started up. And I like to show this because it shows how the technology, because you're doing treatment, keeps on working. Um, and what you have here is the blue is the flow that went through the biological terrain. Uh, the brown is the portion of the flow that was split and brought in front of the filters and recombined with the clarif secondary clarified effluent. And the gray is the total flow. Green is the amount of rain that they experienced over this 10 day period here. So what you basically see here is, you know, and this is pretty typical for any treatment plant, is you maximize the flow through the treatment facility and you're only treating a portion of the flow. But you can see we had average days uh, over, you know, seven MGD uh, coming out of the treatment plant uh, during this 10 day event uh, that occurred here. So actually, you know, we're getting and heat treating all this water. What's important to note is the, the storage tank, it was only going to be 1 million gallons. It would have filled up early in the second day. Uh, and then what do you do with that? Okay, you don't have any place to take that flow and handle that flow. Uh, this is the data from that event for TSS, just to kind of show further here. Um, you can actually see the plant was stressed. They had an upset. Uh, the filter was able to to actually clean that up and help continue to produce an excellent effluent through this event. Uh, ammonia, very similar to what I talked about earlier with Elkhart, this, this allows those through the event easily being able to achieve their, their permit requirement, which is three and a half milligrams per liter. Uh, the missing days in this data is due to weekends. Uh, they're not required to sample on weekends. So ultimately, what do you get out of this? And you know, one of the major benefits Rushville gets is that one million gallons would have filled up where we kept, were able to keep treating over this 10 day period. And since this installation has been operating, they've had multiple times where they've had events of five to 10 days uh, easily out of the facility. So ultimately, um, you know, what does it mean to the treatment plant? Uh, by adding this technology, overall, basically, they see basically very similar effluents uh, coming out of the facility. Uh, before, in 2016, they averaged three TSS and BOD. Uh, in the first year of operation, they averaged uh, two and four, respectively, of BOD and TSS. So you can easily see uh, improved water quality the big difference between the two was in 2016, this data includes none of the wet weather flows that were untreated and discharged to the receiving stream. Here's just a quick picture of the facility. Uh, this was retrofitted into some old con conventional media filters. Uh, water Secondary effluent comes down the middle, can go to one or, or two of the units. Um, once the flow gets over six MGD, uh, the, uh, they bring on the second unit. The wet weather flows can come into either unit uh, by the outside pipes here. So this plant has seen as high as 14 million gallons with a general average day flow condition of 1 million. So this has allowed them a lot of versatility and they were actually able to change from chlorine disinfection to UV disinfection also. Um, the last case study we talk about is a remote site to kind of show the range uh, of the technology's capabilities. Cincinnati has multiple sites that they're looking at and working on to, uh, to handle uh, their wet weather overflows at these remote uh, facilities uh, that they have. And they're really looking for something to start up easy, provide the high performance. This testing was done without chemical addition for remote sites. You can see over 450 TSS and basically an excellent effluent coming out of the system here, 87% removal on average for the study. So uh, great performance uh, ease here. The thing I like to point out here is um, they have pretty liberal standards actually for the TSS removal that they have to meet at the remote sites. Where their issue is they, they have compliance issues with disinfection. It's, it's very difficult to disinfect 450 
uh, TSS. I mean, when you have that type of solids, how can you add enough chlorine? Uh, or you could, you, there's no way you could use UV disinfection that are there. Uh, we captured four major events during, during the study. Uh, their TSS removal requirements are a little unique. They have to be uh, uh, greater than 70% removal when they uh, have over 150 and less than 45 milligrams per liter if it's under 150. And we were able to easily do that and achieve those, those parameters. So moving into some regulatory things uh, specifically um, and talk about, but I like to kind of start off with and just to get people to think, uh, you know, oh, you know, what causes impairments? You know, what is the number one reason for U.S. waters to be, you know, considered to be impaired? You know, our water bodies. Um, you get a lot of different answers uh, to this question. You know, generally people think because we talk a lot about BOD, TSS, uh, those type of things. We spend a lot of time in our industry talking about nutrients, those type of things. But the actual number one cause, uh, according to EPA, is, is actually pathogens, E. coli, crypto, giardia, those type of uh, organisms are the number one reason. And on most of that comes from our uh, wet weather issues that we have throughout the country here. So I find it interesting. And this is why taking out solids and being able to do that allows us now to effectively disinfect. So one of the major reasons uh, for that. So I'd like to just show this uh, 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 slide just to give an example. These are the standards that we generally have to meet at our treatment facilities. 45, 30, uh, and 30 milligrams per liter uh, is a basic uh, standards. Um, equivalent standards, if you have some alternative technologies like a trickling filter, those type of things, you may have a little bit higher standards that we have to meet. But these are the standards we have to do. We've done a bunch of studies now, uh, and uh, some of these facilities are under design, like Elkhart and Rushville is operating. Uh, but in these studies here, uh, you can see the influent conditions in TSS. Uh, the yellow line is 30 milligrams, uh, orange is 45, and gray is 60, just as uh, those standards that we just talked about. As you can see, we're easily able to meet the, the monthly standards, uh, weekly standards that are needed uh, for the actual event events when we're just testing. And all of this data is actually from uh, just doing side stream treatment. So there's no combining the effluent. This is the actual coming out of the treatment unit itself. Uh, and you can see very similar results for BOD, uh, slightly higher. Uh, generally, we find that uh, the lower the ratio of uh, uh, when the plant turns on, in the case of Elkhart, we were turning on in a 2Q, you have a little bit more soluble uh, uh, BOD there. So that's why it's a little bit higher that, that's there. But you can see, this is just coming out of the treatment unit. When you combine it with the low effluent that you'll produce out of, a, uh, of your biological train, you'll easily meet your weekly and monthly permit limits. So the concept of enhanced high rate treatment has been around for a long time. It's been utilized all over. It's been used in the Pacific Northwest as we're seeing and known uh, for some of their CSO facilities, California, but throughout the country, uh, these are the states that are now have operating, you know, peak wet weather flow management systems using either clarification or filtration. So there's more than 40 of them plus operating. It's probably, you know, 50 plus uh, that are actually out there. So uh, it's widely proven from that standpoint. Uh, kind of finishing up with one a little bit is, you know, usually I get the question is, you know, is this a bypass according to the regulations? And this is always under constant debate, but I'll, I'll give you my view on this from that standpoint. And this is the actual language from the federal uh, thing here. And the key thing I think we all have to remember at our treatment plants is, you know, you can do, and we really, I look at it, and this is why I talk about splitting the flow, you're intercepting the flow. Um, what we're trying to do is prevent, prevent damage to, to our installations. Well, you know, keywords, and in, in, in when we think about our facilities, a lot of this is related to, 
you know, what is that damage? If we lose our biomass, that's a severe damage to our facility because we may not be able to meet performance requirements for a period of time. Uh, the other thing is the regulation actually talks about auxiliary treatment facilities. So utilizing these enhanced high rate treatment processes, that is an auxiliary treatment type technologies that are there. So what is severe? This is the language. It's when basically the plants can become inoperable. Well, inoperable means if we lose our biomass, we create massive upset conditions. We lose that natural resource. That creates a problem for us, okay? The last thing is, you know, what is auxiliary treatment? You know, well, and when you think about it, keywords, when you take the definition, you know, it's reserve, it's backup, it's emergency, it's fallback. You know, when you apply the technology in an auxiliary type situation, side stream, or having enough capacity in your filter, you have this fallback back solution. So we'll kind of want to point that out. You know, what is treatment? You know, truthfully, what treatment is, is, is actually the changing by definition of our waste into a non-hazardous waste. It doesn't really say that it has to be physical or chemical done or biologically, it can be by any of those means. Uh, the key is we're making it non-hazardous. And when we're able to do this in a way that we meet our permit requirements, we all know we're, not, we're making it non-hazardous uh, to the uh, people that may come in contact with it. So we're at toward the end of the presentation here and I'd like to finish up with a few points. You know, what do you get from the AquaStorm technology? You get a high quality effluent without chemical addition or we can add chemicals if necessary. You're gonna get better disinfection uh, due to the solids removal during these wet weather events. Uh, you're gonna minimize pathogen risks uh, to, to the receiving stream. Uh, it's giving you equivalent secondary quality at a much lower cost than doing a big major biological expansion. All the operating costs associated with that and the operational issues when you try to scale it through that range. Uh, the AquaStorm technology brings some very unique dual benefits uh, to you, whether it's used for advanced primary or for tertiary filtration also. It's a very small footprint, uh, which in most places we have limited land in our facilities now. And hopefully you see that it's very simple to operate, maintain, start up, shut down, and can be easily uh, operated remotely if, if necessary at a facility. So, we're at the end here and I appreciate your time today. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Uh, really appreciate the thorough presentation. Um, great technical data and always uh, field applications and installation in, uh, descriptions of, of the technology actually being used in the field is, is always really helpful. We have some good, good data on that. So um, before we do have a couple of questions, before we jump into those, first we'll post a quick survey for attendees. Um, and this is an opt-in to have your contact information shared with our presenter today, John. Um, and I think your last slide there, John, had um, your contact information, which will also be sent out by PNCWA following this presentation. So um, that will also be shared. So if you can take a minute um, and please fill out the survey whether you would like to opt into uh, the contact list. Okay, so everybody should have had a moment or so to take advantage of that. Thank you. Um, so the first question, John, here, uh, excuse me, before we jump into the first kind of technical question, there was a question about the availability of the slides and a recording of the presentation. Um, the recording of the presentation will be available on the PNCWA website. It's the same site that you would have gone to to register for the presentation. There's a, um, a table there and this presentation will have a hyperlink to a recording of the presentation after um, in the next day or so. So that will be available. And then to get an actual PDF of the slides, I would say, please reach out to John directly for that. Maybe John can speak to whether that would be available. Yeah, I'll, I'll email it to you. If you send me an email, um, I can send it right to you. Okay, great, thank you. And again, that his contact will be sent out um, following this presentation. So. Uh, the first question we have today um, is in relation to using this technology with disinfection. And the question is, if uh, a plant's wet weather flow already exceeds the plant's disinfection capacity, 
uh, can this technology still be used and how? Um, it can be used. Um, and when you say it exceeds your disinfection capabilities, um, uh, is that because you're not taking out the solids is, is probably the real question. Is that why your disinfection is exceeded? If it, that's the case, it's gonna provide a big impact to it. Um, it and in some cases, in most cases, when people are looking at this type of expansion, they're having to expand their disinfection capabilities because they're designing for more flows than they historically have been disinfecting and treating for. So there probably would be an expansion unless they aren't removing any solids as, it, as is, and that's the demand need. So you're saying potentially there's an increase in the efficiency of the disinfection process if you have less colloidal or solid material that's um, either inhibiting your UV penetration or uh, or chlorine demand. Yeah, your chlorine demand. So, so in the case of um, uh, Cincinnati, when they get the they 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 dose enough at times when it's very dilute, but when it's 450, they can't add enough chlorine. Um, yeah. It depends on the influent conditions. Okay. Uh, we have another question coming through. Have you seen any damage to the filter media due to grit um, at this person's plant? Uh, during peak flows, they get grit making it all the way to the aeration basin. So can you maybe speak a little bit to the interaction of grit with this technology? Um, we expect the grit to fall out. We haven't seen any issues with grit on the system. Uh, we know we, we collect some of that in the hoppers, okay? And that one of the big things that we're doing is we're removing it a lot more regularly than you you see in, um, uh, and you would normally do it in a primary clarifier. So um, we try to keep it uh, uh, you know fresh and moved out of there those solids because just to give you a, a relative impact the the footprint of this technology the actual filtration tankage area is about uh, less than ten percent of the footprint of a primary clarifier. So you won't have much uh, time to hold solids in there. You're moving them in and out very quickly. So we don't allow the grit to kind of build up. Um, we, we, are, uh, we do have an option. I don't really talk about it here. It's uh, where we'll have a, a screw if the grit is really, really bad. Um, we have some potential customers that have asked that that uh, has a screw mechanism versus the hydraulic pump removal that'll actually have a kind of combination to remove any grit that would actually get into the system. But in terms of damage in the system, uh, the grit that has come in uh, generally falls out, gets removed out of the hoppers. Okay. Maybe kind of a tangential question to that. Can you speak a little bit to the life cycle of the actual filter media or that that um, the replacement of that component of the technology. So, so the media, um, you know, historically we've found with the media, it'll last seven to 10 years in a tertiary application where it's running day in, day out. Um, what we found, um, the longest operating system we have for primary has put uh, almost three years of operation that's running 365 days. So when you get actually into the wet weather side where you're not running nearly as much, um, we expect the life to be close to 10 plus years um, because you're just not putting runtime on the system uh, that much. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'd be curious, does the use of uh, a chemical uh, for chemically enhanced treatment, like use like say alum, uh, does that increase the frequency of the bash, backwash cycle? Like does that chemical block in, um interact with the filter media at all or, or increase yeah. head loss across the it, it It does. Um, it's, it's um, you know, anytime you add more solids, it's, it's, we're taking out more. So it does increase the frequency. Uh, so when we take sizing into consideration on any, any system, if we're going to add a chemical addition, that would be included in our calculations. Okay. And, and where does the typical backwash go when chemical application is used? Say if you're removing um, something like phosphorus uh, so, with chemo. Sure, go ahead. So, so in in the case of let's say Elkhart or Rushville does phosphorus removal too, they just recycle it to their in the wet weather application to a primary clarifiers, and 
it actually helps a little bit with settling, you okay. know, in those those clarifiers. Um, okay, so then that's removed in the primary sludge, mm -hmm. the system. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, we have about two minutes left. If anybody has any additional questions, uh, please post them in the chat box. And I guess I have one more. Can you speak a little bit to um, pilot testing or like skid mounted? Um, systems that you you have available for plants to try out or use? Um, yes, we have uh, uh, five different units here in North America um, that we uh, move around the country. They're, they're, uh, one's in a trailer, the other are standalones that, that you unload off of a truck and set it there. Um, and they're, they're available for, for testing uh, for, for any of the applications and, and, and sites. Um, We've tested all over, as you can see from some of the data. I just showed the wet weather data, but we've done primary studies, uh, you know, primary treatment studies. So we're doing a lot of different testing. It's a new, new relative in our industry. Anything, even if it's four years old, is still new. Okay, uh, here. So we do a lot of pilot testing. So they're all available. They are, are pretty much automated. They have um, a remote SCADA systems to log all the data. Um, I'm able to check in on pilots sitting from my house in, at any time. Uh, and, the, uh, and we provide that to the operations staff too, because uh, a lot of facilities are unmanned. They have a pilot on site. If they wanted to check in on it at any time, they can do it also. Okay, great, well, thank you. Um, so we're at the hour. One other note, there was one person that called in over via phone. Um, if you're still on the line, it looks like they, they may be um, aren't on anymore, but if you're still on, please contact Peen CWA so you can, uh, we can ensure to issue CEUs for your attendance. Um, and then we will share John's contact information. Please reach out to him with additional questions or a copy of the presentation. Thank you for your time today, John. And um, thank you. Thanks, Casey. Absolutely.